me? How's everybody doing this morning? Can you believe it? It was 64 degrees this morning on my drive to church. At the end of June? Are you kidding me? How awesome and wonderful is that? Amazing. Enjoy it while we can because the heat's coming, right? <clears throat> indeed, indeed. Well, welcome to all of you. Welcome to those that are viewing online. I uh, hope you've all had a great week and it's uh, just great to be together as God's people uh, worshiping on this Sabbath day. Hey, just a couple of things that are upcoming. One is uh, camp meeting uh, is going to be coming up starting July the 14th. The first Sabbath of camp meeting, we'll be broadcasting the live feed from camp meeting for the worship service here uh, in the sanctuary. So just... Uh, those of you that aren't going to be able to be there will be able to see the message that's delivered that Sabbath morning. Uh, we have one item of business also that um, has been overlooked uh, for some reason, and we apologize for this, but back on October 8th, 2022, at the Pathfinder Union Campery, Luciano Cruz uh, was baptized. I think we've got some music playing. Is there still some, do you guys hear some music playing? All right. Yeah, that's better. Okay. I mean, I've got a boisterous voice, but still, it's, it's, that's better. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but Luciano Cruz uh, was baptized at Pathfinder Campery, and um, we had just overlooked voting him into membership. So I'd like to seek a motion that we accept Luciano into membership here at our church. Is there a motion? Okay, so moved. Is there a second? Thank you. All in favor, uplifted hands, of course. And uh, that's an easy one. By the way, uh, church family, there are different ways of getting involved in, in church life. Uh, we're needing um, some people. If you would consider serving as a greeter, we could use some more help. Judy Jocks is our coordinator for the greeters. And uh, so if you could have any interest, you can reach out to one of the uh, pastoral staff or Alex, our secretary. Um, or contact Judy Jocks uh, directly as well. And uh, that uh, would be so helpful. So thank you for being here this morning. Uh, would you just stand up, go find somebody you don't know, introduce yourself and say good morning, happy Sabbath. And then we'll get started with worship. Okay, take just a couple of minutes to do that.
kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. Oh, that Jesus and Holy Spirit, we kneel before you today confessing our sins and asking your forgiveness as you've promised. Today we live in a world that is so confused and we uh, as humans are confused as well. We have so much pressure from politics, from finances, from um, choices we make as families. We're just confused. It seems as though that Maybe the gods of ancient Israel have returned to uh, haunt us and torment us and, and uh, uh, encourage us to worship other gods. Today, Father, we want to lift you up. We want to praise your name. We want to worship you. We want to surrender to you. We want you to be our leader and 
Help us with your Holy Spirit to make the decisions that are right and true. My concern today is for families that are raising children and the, the, the so much confusion that is going on now and, and the choices that children have to make and the, the choices that they have and the things that they can view and read and, and see online and, and just the, the many, many directions that they go. And, and I ask, Lord, that you'll bring a special blessing on the parents as they um, guide their children, as they help them make decisions and not just allow their children to make decisions on their own. We're confused as a nation, and Lord, we just ask that you'll uh, restore that that hedge of protection that you've promised and, and protect us and guide us. And, and then, uh, Lord, we ask that you will help us have the wisdom to open our minds to your direction and your leading and to make those tough decisions for ourselves and our families. There's many people in our church that are suffering and uh, from illnesses, from uh, just many of life's uh, confusing things. And Lord, today, that is my prayer, that we surrender to you and that we give you uh, our will and let you guide us and be open to that. In thy name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, so chapter 12 in Hebrews follows chapter 11, and of course chapter 11 is the great uh, chapter of faith, the hall of faith, if you will. All these beings, uh, 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 people throughout history uh, that are recorded in the Bible that exercised great faith. And they are accounted for in chapter 11. And then he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, and we're going to find several let us 
instructions here. Let us throw off everything that hinders. One. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that has been marked out for us. There's a race that's been marked out for you, for me, for us as God's people. So he's saying, look, we've got these great witnesses of faith, so let us throw off everything that hinders us from running this race that's been marked out for us. Uh, let's let go of and cast off the sin that so easily entangles us. And for all of us, that's a different sin, maybe, or sins. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he's instructing us now to consider Him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men. Consider Him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Father God, as we go into Your Word this morning, I pray that Your Holy Spirit would minister to each one that is listening. Lord, may You guide us in our thinking. Lord, help us to understand the truth and bless us according to our need is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in this text were three let us instructions. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Let us throw off the sin that easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance. So we've been called to run. We've been called to go somewhere, to do some things. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I appreciated Ed's prayer where it's easy for us to worship other gods and be distracted with all the things around us in our world. And boy, it's true. Idolatry is still a thing. So as we begin this new sermon series, um, it's fluctuated a bit for me as to how many parts we're going to have in this. Um, so it's still kind of, I'm not sure. I was going to announce today that it was cut down from 3 to 2, and then God woke me up this morning at 4.30, and I think it may go 4. So I don't, you know, we'll see, we'll see how, it le how, how it goes here. Um, but this particular text in Hebrews, I think, when we're asking ourselves the question about why Adventism, I think this text provides a grounding, a foundation from which we can put roots into this as we think about the meaning and the relevance of Adventism today, in our world today, in your life and in my life. You see, <clears throat> for some of you younger people, this may be all that you know in terms of coming to the Adventist church on Saturdays or the Sabbath and worshiping God. Um, for others of you, you've come to uh, accept and join the Adventist church and its teachings later on in life. But at the end of the day, young people, you need to hear me. And I, 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 I want to say this now. It's going to be important for you as young people to know for yourself why you believe what you believe and why Adventism is important or not to you. Now, by the same token, especially those of you that are finishing up high school and into college, it's, it's a good thing for you at this stage of your, of your life and development to give thought and to ask questions. And you may have some very valid and sincere questions. It's not a bad thing to question. In fact, I agree with Plato who once said, we question the truth not in order to discard it, but rather to get to the very heart of it. And so, 
digging in and questioning truth and questioning our beliefs and, and even questioning, you know, okay, this is the Adventist church and, and I, I'm familiar with it. I've, I've grown up in this. Uh, for some of us, it's all we've ever known. The question though is today, you need to know as you set the course of your life, young people, and even for those of us who are older, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Or not. Now, there are people here that attend church regularly, and I love them dearly. They may not be Seventh-day Adventists. That's great. All are welcome. But in this sermon series, I'm going to try to make a compelling case for all of us to reevaluate why Adventism came into existence, why it still is relevant today, and why there's a mission that God has called us to that is still valid and pertinent and still has a message of hope of Jesus' love. We're, we're, we're one of many denominations, but there's some specific things and purposes that God has ordained by bringing this church into existence and we need to know what they are. I'm going to say this to the older folks, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles. If you're not clear on why you're a Seventh-day Adventist, your kids and grandkids won't be clear on why they are or should be. So we all need to know and understand that we're not here just because, well, this is what we do. Now let me say from the outset, I am first a Christ follower. I hope all of you are first a Christ follower and then secondarily Adventist, if you're Adventist, or the Christian church or the Baptist church or whatever one may be. I agree with George Knight, the church historian in Adventism, that said this, to have any value, our Adventism must be immersed in Christianity. Without that immersion, it is no better than any other deluded ism. Right? Absolutely. So unless, in essence, unless Adventism is Christocentric or centered in Christ, it's worthless as all those other false religions. So beginning right here as we begin this study, we've, we're establishing the fact that Christ is and must be at the very center. And we must, as Paul said in Hebrews, fix our eyes on Christ Jesus. So, why Adventism? Why be a Seventh-day Adventist? Now, for some of you, the answer is simple. You can't help it. You were born that way. Uh, others feel, well, it, it's, you know, it, it, somehow I like it. I, I like hanging out with these people. It feels good to be an Adventist. Some of you might even be addicted to Adventism. You wouldn't know what to do without it. But this is an important and serious question. And after nearly 65 years in the church, I'll confess, I'm, I'm still not addicted. And for me, there have to be some good reasons to be an Adventist or even remain one. Frankly, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist by conviction rather than by choice. Now, Throughout this series, I want to invite you to reflect on the meaning of Adventism and how you're relating to the church that you interact with, the body of Christ that you're a part of. And consider, why, why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Why am I here? Now, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of books written and a lot of discussion in the Christian community at large and in secular communities as well about the deconstructing of Christianity. The secularist human view is that you'll be better off without Christianity. In other words, if you could just get delivered from that old way of thinking, you could move into enlightenment. And so you need to basically deconstruct your Christian faith 
and then rebuild something. Now, you remember a few months ago, we talked about the faux gospel or, or the fake gospel. And so there's this true gospel that involved, you know, in Genesis when humanity fell and then Jesus came and provided uh, atonement for our sins and provide salvation to reconcile us back to the Father. And then we looked at the other column on the right-hand side where, where in humanism we're just, we're just trying to look within ourselves to figure things out and, and, and to put together our own plan of how we're going to save ourselves or live life to its fullest or ultimately to find peace and joy and meaning in life and fulfillment. The challenge is, and young people who are in college right now, again, I want to just say to you, it's, it's good and valid to ask deep questions. At some point, most of the adults here have at some point in their life or Christian journey had some serious doubts about their faith. And again, that's okay. But I've noticed in the last 20 years or so, and, and there's this great tension that's developed within Christianity, and there's a progressive, uh, uh, very liberal kind of uh, theology that has found its way into Christianity, and we see this uh, demonstrated by our guest speaker's topic that was addressed a few weeks ago and how different Christians are relating to these topics that are, that are real, valid, very uh, serious concerns for the communities in which we live and, and the choices that our young people are facing. And so th this idea of deconstructing your faith and then reconstructing your faith has some validity, but young people in college and, and, and even adults that may be in this situation where you're questioning and, and you're... I'll admit, for me, I did have to go through a deconstructing process from the theology of how I was raised and what I was taught as a kid, I see God much differently now than I did. That doesn't, I'm not dogging my parents or my grandparents. I'm not dogging the church of when I was a kid or a teenager. I'm just saying I've learned so much more about the truth of God and I see God so amazingly, incredibly different now than I did even 15 or 20 years ago. So, so this idea, Adventism believes, one of our fundamental beliefs is that truth is progressive. Truth continues to unfold and we continue to learn more and more and more about God. In other words, revelation or inspiration is, it's, it's not static. It's, it's active and it's moving forward. But be careful in the process of your doubting. Be careful in your process of asking questions. Be careful of the books you read. Now, look at all the evidence for yourself, yes. But I've seen many people lose their faith while going through this process. So I'm affirming all of us to say it's great to have questions. Listen, God's truth can stand up to the closest scrutiny. So God's not afraid of your big questions. But at the end of the day, we also want to come out of this with a better, more positive understanding of God and His truths and the reality of the world in which we're living and the reality of what God is calling us to. We should acknowledge this morning that had we been born in different families, if we had different upbringings, many of us would be Lutheran or Baptist, or Catholic, or even agnostic. So, a lot of us are Adventists simply because we were born Adventist. Some have questioned their faith and said, I'm going to stay a part of this. I see the validity of what God's Word teaches, and the church certainly isn't perfect. And folks, if you ever did find a perfect church, don't go there. Because the second you show up, it's ruined. So the church isn't perfect. We've got our issues. And every denomination has struggles. In the recent weeks, you've seen the Southern Baptists. Uh, they're, they're, they're dealing with the issue of women's ordination, much to, uh, uh, similar to what we went through back in 2015. 
Uh, there's the Methodist church that is splitting right now. Some churches are breaking off from the mother denomination because of their stance on homosexuality and LGBTQ and so forth. So there's, there's, there's kind of two world views even within the church that some of these denominations are wrestling with and struggling with. And this is the very real world that, that we all live in. Now the reality is that most people remain, at least in name, to the religion that they were born into. Now if you look at the statistics, you've got 44% that no longer are in the faith of their childhood. But you've got 56% that are. Now, that 44% that, that's, that's up huge over the last 20 to 30 years. A lot more people are changing their faith um, compared to what it used to be. But so right now, you look at, and it runs down the list of Catholics and Protestants and who's affiliated and who's unaffiliated and, and so forth. But the numbers tell us that it's likely that whatever faith you're born into, you're likely to remain a part of that faith. And regardless of your affiliation, religious communities consist of two sorts of members. Practicing believers and cultural adherence. Imagine that you were born Adventist, your father is a pastor, your mother is a church school teacher, your grandfather was a conference president, and you are a fifth generation Adventist. Most people in that situation, with that family dynamic in play, the most difficult and radical thing for them to do would be to leave the church. Because that has provided everything for their social context, for their understanding of God, their religious training and upbringing, even the social networks that they're a part of. Because after all, if you're born into a community and you're raised in that faith community, that's what you know. That's what's familiar. That's, you have, many of you have lifelong friendships that have developed from childhood or school years. And, and you've been in touch and you stay in touch with some of those friends. Now, it's interesting that a lot of people, while not maybe currently practicing as a believer or and this applies whether you're Baptist or or Methodist or or Adventist um, in a sense even if I'm not practicing it it's easier to still call myself an Adventist I run into this quite a bit when I uh, am called to the hospital to do visits because sometimes uh, patients will put on their sheet that they're Seventh-day Adventist um, but I go to meet them, and I don't, I don't know them. I've never seen them before. I've never met them. But a lot of times, we just, it's easy for us to just say, well, I, I'm, I still consider myself a Seventh-day Adventist, and, and even though um, they, they, they've left, but they haven't really left. Um, and even consider the culture of the church. Think about some of your family and friends that are no longer practicing Adventists. They're no longer attending church. But they still enjoy a good veggie burger. Or haystacks. Right? They haven't completely let go of all the aspects of, of the culture and community. That is Adventism. And the numbers tell us that it's preferable to stay rather than to cut ourselves off from our cultural roots and our family. In other words, there is a certain level of comfort and security in playing church even if you don't believe all that stuff. I hope that in our time together in this sermon series that you will be challenged at the level of, am I just playing church? Or am or is this something that's for real for me, for
for my family, for my kids, for my fellow church members. You see, there are, in my mind and my heart, there are some very compelling reasons why Seventh-day Adventism was brought into existence. Uh, there are some very compelling reasons why uh, Adventism still exists today as a worldwide church. And more importantly, there's my personal conviction that I need to be one. So young people, I'm going to take us on a little journey that's history. Now, when I was young, I didn't care so much for history. I've noticed that as I've gotten older, I really appreciate history a lot more. But here's the thing. Adventism didn't come into existence uh, in, an, in a vacuum. In other words, there were, there, 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 when we look at the God story, the story of God's interaction with humanity throughout time since creation, there's been this journey that God has been on trying to reconcile humanity back to Himself. And, and, and as we're on this journey and as we go through the whole story, this history informs and helps us to understand why God has done what He's done. And why He's allowed what He's allowed. Some of the great questions... You know, the, the, the great question that, that so many people ask is, if God is so loving and all-powerful, how come there's so much evil and pain and sorrow in this world? Well, see, you can only explain that if you understand the God story. And that there's a cosmic story. There's something that's bigger and beyond humanity and this earth. And in that cosmic context, you can explain some things that otherwise are unexplainable. So, you know, we, we've talked over the last several years about the God story and, and eternity past, right? And then God comes in, He creates the earth, and Jesus comes in in the middle of the story and saves us, and then we're all headed back, and we can't wait to get into that eternity future when we will be with God throughout all eternity for billions and billions and billions and billions of years to go in the future. Now, those of you, we have about 50 or 55 of us that are on a journey that we've been going through the Arise Online program. And I just want to encourage those of you uh, to keep up and keep doing that. We're going we're gonna to probably make this available for another year because I know in the group that I participate in, um, we're not going to get through it all in one year. Uh, but so, so the way that Ty Gibson and David Asherick kind of list out this, this God story is they have these, these seven chapters, right? Pre-creation and then creation, the fall of humanity, the covenant, Messiah, the church, and then recreation in the new earth. So, so however we want to articulate this, this continuum of time that is the human experience, that is the God story, it's in that continuum of God condescending to humanity to help deliver us from sin, sorrow, pain, and recreate this earth new eventually and recreate all of us new eventually. Since the fall of humanity, God has entrusted certain people to speak on His behalf. As Adam was instructed by Christ, he handed the truth down to the next generation. He, he, he was the mouthpiece of God. He, he was the trustee, so to speak, of, of saying, look, this is what happened. This is where I blew it. And this is the reality of sin. And look at the consequences of, of my disobedience and, and my sin. And so there's this information about reality. You know, a lot of what's going on in today's world, a lot of the discussions that we're having today, a lot of the disagreements even within the church are all about a dispute about what is real. What is reality? And if you're a Christian, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you want to say, well, I, I want to have a, a biblical worldview. I want to have a Christian, Christ-centered worldview. I want, to, I want to anchor my view and understanding of reality on God's Word. Everything else is shifting sand. 
And so Adam begins to pass this down. And yet over time, humanity put God out of their knowledge. Humanity began to to worship creatures of their own imaginings. And even when the world was still in its infancy, you come to Genesis chapter 6, and evil had become so deep and widespread that God could no longer bear it. Ellen White says this in Patriarchs and Prophets, amid the prevailing corruption of the world at that time, Methuselah, Noah, and many others labored to keep alive the knowledge of the what? True God. And to restrain the tide of moral evil. So, Here God came out of eternity. He creates the earth and we get to Genesis 6 and man, oh man, we're already right here and He can't take it anymore. The Bible says that mankind's thoughts were continuously on evil. And so time begins to move forward. I'm not sure. Let me get back. It skipped way forward on me somehow. All right. Into this mess in Genesis 6, God calls Noah. He tells Noah, He instructs Noah to build an ark. He tells him to preach a warning message to the antediluvian world of what was to come. So Noah now becomes the trustee. The word, the, the, the vocal speaker of, of what is reality and the reality that is to come. And Noah preaches his heart out for 120 years. The Central California Conference would have fired him as an evangelist. He was one of the worst evangelists ever known to humanity because only his family got on board with him. Everyone else rejected. Following the global flood and the Tower of Babel, God calls Abraham and he makes a covenant. And then later through his sons, Isaac and Jacob, comes the nation of Israel. And as God's chosen people, Israel then becomes the trustees of the Gospel. They were to be an example, a shining light in the pagan countries surrounding them. To to elevate their thinking in their minds to the true God of heaven and earth. Their whole existence, when they were coming out of Egypt, God had to rebuild them as a people. They forgot the faith of their fathers. And God implements the whole sanctuary system and the sacrificial system and and, and God is at the center of their very existence. And everything that they do is pointing forward to the coming Messiah. They are the trustees of the Gospel. But that relationship was conditional. It was based on covenant. And when they rejected the Messiah, Jesus then established a new covenant And that's where we have the establishment of the New Testament church. Throughout the God story, since the fall of humanity, God has always had people to speak on His behalf. To represent the truth. To counter the darkness with light. And it seems to me that we can find in Scriptures seven groups of trustees. Number one, the patriarchs. Number two, the family of Abraham. Number three, the nation of Israel. Under the New Covenant, the Christian church that was established. And then the Protestant movement that came in the 1500s. And then the remnant. 
Now, God has always had a remnant. Noah and his family that got in the ark, they were the remnant that was left over after the flood. So, throughout history, God has had a group of people that have been faithful to Him and proclaiming His truth. And ultimately, in the new creation, in the eternity going forward, you and I, the redeemed of all the ages, will be the trustees that will continue to, to speak about our experience. To glorify Christ and all that He has done to save us and reconcile us to Himself. To heal us. We will continue throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity be the trustees of the Gospel of Jesus. Now, the story of humanity and the history of the fall and fallen humanity and all the way through the Old Testament with the children of Israel can be visually demonstrated this way. So, if you look at the top here is wholeness. This is how God created everything to begin with. Everything was good. Everything was perfect. Everything was whole. But then you know what happened, even beginning with Lucifer in heaven. He started whispering lies about the character of God. And so in the lies, there's a forgetting then of what reality really is. So all of a sudden, Satan starts with his lies to paint a, a different picture of reality. And there's a forgetting of what reality really is as it is established by God. Then there's a rebelling. There's a turning away and, and an abandoning of God. But then as we know from the fall of humanity, there are some consequences that come with rebellion and turning your, your, your heart away from God, right? The purpose of the God story, the purpose of God's Word, the Bible then, is to confront our condition as we're in this sinful, sinful mess. And God's Word shines light on the darkness of our own hearts and our own minds. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is an awakening. And that awakening stirs in us. I saw a saying this week that said if churches and people in the church didn't need correcting, half of the New Testament wouldn't have been written. It's true, right? That's me. I, I need that. Yep, that. I resemble that. So, so th this is a cycle that just gets... It has gotten lived initially by Lucifer's rebellion in heaven and God labored with him. God confronted him. God tried to awaken him. And in fact, in Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White says that he was convinced of his wrong. But he pursued his own way because of pride. And so he's reaping the inevitable consequences of that rebellion. But when God's truth comes to you and I, when God's truth comes to all of the people that you read about in, in the story of, of, of God's interfacing with humanity, God, through the Holy Spirit, awakens sinful, broken humanity. And He calls them to remember. Remember the truth. Remember how things, remember how things were created to be right up here. This is the ultimate reality. What you're living right now, that's not the way I intended it to be. And that reality can change, but it can only change if you will be my people and I can be your God. Which leads us then to repentance. And we come confessing our sin. And we say, Jesus, I blew it. I need You. Help me. Save me. Cleanse me. Revive me. And we can see this pattern constantly repeat through the history of mankind. The children of Israel were in this constant churning of this cycle of rebellion and then coming back to repentance and then revival and reformation and back to being in relationship with God. Now, what's interesting is that there's a relationship directly across 
from one another. So the wholeness and God's Word are connected. The lies and the awakening are connected. The forgetting and the remembering are connected. The rebellion or the abandonment of God and revival, see, they're connected. Inevitable consequences is restoring us back to being made new. And so God is pursuing... The, the God story is about God pursuing redemption and restoration for His people. I want to make a statement right here on this point. The wrath of God isn't so much about punishing people as it is about delivering God's people from their enemies. Let that sink in. So God's purpose, He's he's seeking for redemption and restoration. And there are consequences. Satan got kicked out of heaven. Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But ultimately, apart from God, there is no life. And God's about reconnecting us to Himself so that we can live. That we can ultimately be restored and recreated so that we can be whole again. That we can be happy again. What's happening in your life? The temptations that you face? The issues, you know, Paul in Hebrews, we were, we were talking about let us cast off all those things that hinder. Let us cast off those sins that so easily entangle. The journey that you're on is in many ways the same as the children of Israel and the patriarchs of old. The lies that Satan whispered then are the same lies he's whispering now. They're just repackaged in a contemporary context for our generation. It's it's the same thing though. The patterns are just repeating. This cycle is repeated throughout the story of, of God's people. Satan's strategies and patterns are clearly established and God's solution to the sin problem which is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is clearly established. That's the only answer. Let me tell you. We all know. Politics and government aren't going to get it done for us. It's only Jesus that's going to get it done for us. Right? Without Jesus, there is no hope. So, so, yes, should we try to make a difference in our world today? Yes. Should we be concerned about those who are oppressed and suffering? Yes. Should we make a difference? Should we be the hands and feet of Jesus to relieve some of that suffering absolutely we're not being salt and light if we're not doing that stuff but at the end of the day it's only jesus and god that can take this world from the mess that it's in and restore it back and create us all new and the cycle is played out it's played out in the new testament church you get past the first four gospels of the new testament and the book of acts And the remainder of the New Testament is the apostles arguing against Satan's lies and deceptions that are creeping into the church. You know, Paul addresses the Corinthians about sexual purity and confronting and repenting from sexual impurity. So the church, the the trustees of the Gospel of Christ speaking out against sin is nothing new. That's part of light confronting darkness. But just because God confronts me with His truth doesn't make God a hater. Which then by inference means that I can disagree with somebody without hating them. Just because I disagree with someone on something doesn't mean that I'm a hater. And as Christians, church, we have to have the courage. You know, we came out of this series on Daniel, and we've talked about Daniel and his three Hebrew friends and and standing strong for God and standing boldly for God. Hey, I'm not looking to pick a fight with anybody. But I think all of us need to have the courage to stand boldly for what is right. And we need to do so in a Christ-like and loving way. So these issues are not new confronting different kinds of sins is nothing new. And at the root of Israel's struggle 
is the apostle struggle in the New Testament church, and the apostles called that New Testament church to repentance. In the messages to the seven churches, in Revelation 2 and 3, every church is called to repentance. You and I are called to repentance. Following the destruction of Jerusalem, the powers of earth and hell arrayed themselves against God's people. And persecution began under Nero about the time that the Apostle Paul was martyred. And persecution continued for centuries. However, the more the church was persecuted, the more the church grew. An early Christian apologist, Tertullian, is credited with saying this, the oftener I'm not sure what good English that is, but the oftener that we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow, the blood of Christians is seed. The seventh church in Revelation is Laodicea. And that church is comfortable. Rich and increased in goods, in need of nothing. And that church is rebuked by Jesus for being apathetic. But under persecution, the church thrives and grows strong. Satan, realizing that he wasn't winning the battle, the church was growing, he decided that he would be more successful he attempted to do something else against the government of God. And so he decided to plant his banner in the Christian church. Because in essence, what he failed to secure by force, he would now gain through deception. Very cunning deception. And rather than being the enemy on the outside, he would become the enemy on the inside but they, many of them, wouldn't know it. Again, Ellen White says this in Great Controversy, now the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, and sword were blessings in comparison with this. What? Prison, torture, fire, sword were blessings. You see, the church suddenly goes in a whole different direction in this course of history and under the cloak of pretended Christianity. Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith, turn their minds from the word of truth. The Bible was no longer accepted as the standard of faith. And the doctrine of religious freedom, that was termed heresy by the church of that day. And its upholders were hated. Paul even writes in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Even back then. Church, ultimately, this is Satan. And Satan is working through human agencies to accomplish His purposes. And the Apostle Paul foretold the great apostasy that would result in the establishment of, of pagan Rome turning into papal Rome. And as persecutions ceased for a time, Christianity suddenly began to enter the courts and uh, and palaces of kings. And the church, rather than being this humble, simple group, said that we want to be in the places of power. We're going we're to get political. We're going to influence things. And un with the nominal conversion of Constantine in the early 4th century, came that gigantic system of false religion. And the church began to intermingle paganism with Christianity. And this is how Satan 
moved himself into a seat of power and position to rule the earth according to his will. In the coming months, we'll be talking a lot more about and looking at the, prof, uh, the apocalyptic prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. The biggest event, and I, and I hope you'll remember this, the biggest event that you should anticipate and be concerned about is the appearance of Satan claiming to be Christ. Sure, we know that in Bible prophecy it talks about the United States uh, joining hands with the papal entity and the war of the king of the north and the king of the south and all of those things that you know Elder Rosenberg looked at when he was here uh, earlier this year. But church, I, I, I fear that we've used so much of our um, so much we've used so much of our prophetic firepower and aimed it at Rome that we're we've taken our eye off of who the real enemy is. Paul says in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rules and powers. So yes, he's, Satan will accomplish much of his purposes through different entities in our world today. But the real enemy is Satan. And when he appears, then all of the world will wander. Can you imagine him being in Visalia and us preaching the gospel against him? What? Talk about terrifying to confront him? I mean, the dude's got the dude's got game. You know? I don't like him. And 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 you know, he has powers that I don't have, and yet we all are called to be these trustees of the gospel in a time just before Jesus comes. And as this whole thing goes down, and Satan is putting this system in place, we come into those 1260 years that were prophesied in Daniel 7. They began in 538 AD and continued till 1798 AD. And that period of time is known as the Dark Ages. And that's where Satan did every thing he could to banish and destroy God's Word. The Bible. As he worked to keep these ancient words from speaking. Those, those words that bring that bring life and, and hope and salvation. The God story of, of how God has created and, and how through time God has had these, these, these people, these trustees of the Gospel that give a voice to the true reality that is found only in God. And to understand the craziness of the world around us in which we exist today. The only way to make sense of that, folks, is to understand the truth about God. And to be in relationship with Jesus and to confess to Him and allow Him to be Lord and Savior in your life. Well, next time we'll go further into how this developed and all of these, this history young people, it led to a, an awakening time when God had, it had gotten pretty dark and the common person, the everyday human being, the, not the elites, not the educated, but the everyday normal people like you and I had no access to the truth. And these 1,200 years were so 
just, I mean, the darkness, spiritual darkness was incredible, but God wasn't finished yet. He would restore His Word once again. And next time, we'll explore that next chapter in the church's history that ultimately gives birth to Protestantism and that eventually gives birth to Adventism. Let me say definitively, the reasons for all of that history and the reasons for why we exist as a people today, the Christian church in, with our Protestant brothers and sisters, we've all been entrusted with the Gospel of Christ. We all have a contribution to make. But notice his strategy. The devil's strategy was to do away with this. Why? Because there's power right here. There's light right here. These ancient words I believe are more relevant today than ever in earth's history. As we close our worship time this morning, let's sing together that song, Ancient Words. pray that the ancient words of Scripture would not just be words on a page, but Lord, that we could experience Your words, those ancient words, as the living Word that would bring power and life to our souls. God, I know the world around us wants us to think, and, and they try to influence people to think that Your Word is outdated, it's old-fashioned, it's not relevant. That's like so yesterday kind of thinking. But Lord, as your trustees, we want to be your ambassadors. We want to be your salt and light in this world. So Lord, help us 
to let those ancient words soak deep into our hearts and minds. Let it transform us to be more and more like Jesus. And Lord, as the instruction that we read in Hebrews today, let us cast off everything that hinders. Let us cast off those sins that so easily entangle. Let us run with perseverance the race that has been set before us. And let, our, fix our eye, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great week this week. Thank you for being here.